Donald Trump endorsing and publicly supporting Mary Ann Mendoza and Marjorie Taylor Greene, both supporters of QAnon and their anti-Jewish conspiracy theories, Elon Musk's posts on X, and a Dutch politician openly calling political opponents lizard people, are just a few examples of the widespread presence of anti-Jewish rhetoric and conspiracy theories in our current political landscape. One cannot help but wonder at the pervasiveness of these anti-Jewish narratives and where they come from. This podcast series aims to trace and historicize these ideas through important documents that helped shape them, from the Gospel of Matthew to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. In this episode, we go back in time, all the way to the second century of the Common Era, to the Piri Pasha. The Piri Pasha, or On Passover, is a homily concerning the Christian celebration of the Passion and is most often attributed to the Bishop of Sardis, Melito. This attribution, and most of our knowledge on the document, has been hypothesized by 4th century bishop and Christian historian Eusebius. That is, until the discovery of a Greek version of the text in 1940 and the excavation of the synagogue of Sardis two decades later. These discoveries provided much needed context on the text, but mainly posed more questions. Nevertheless, our understanding of the document hasn't changed much since these discoveries. Despite its academic importance in shaping our understanding of Christian-Jewish relationships in Asia Minor around the time of the separation of early Christians away from Judaism, one of the few major comprehensive studies on this document was done by Dr. Lynn Koek in her book The Peri Pasha Attributed to Melito of Sardis, published in 2020. Imagine you are a Christian, walking down a street of Sardis around the year 190 of the Common Era. The sun is glaring in the sky and it is hot. You've just bought some dried fruit from a Jewish vendor at the market and are returning to your home and its several Jewish neighbors. As a bead of sweat drips down your forehead, you consider the homily you heard yesterday, held by the Bishop of Sardis. In it, you were presented with a comparison between the first Jewish Passover celebration and the celebration of the Passion by Christians, something your family has started celebrating relatively recently compared to the long history of Passover celebrations. The lives of many of the people who listened to Melito's homily were very intertwined with Jewish culture and the lives of Jewish people in Sardis, and it is important to consider this environment when attempting to understand its contents. As I said, this document's narrative is based on a comparison between the celebration of the first Passover by Jews and the celebration of the Passion by early Christians. Eusebius actually speculated that these two halves were two separate homilies and were later made into one. Most scholars, however, disagree with this idea. Notably, an argument is made that the rhetorical abilities Melito displays throughout the text would be lessened considerably if they were not originally written as one. And interestingly, Miriam S. Taylor argues that the form of the text emphasizes the supersessionary message she obviously attrib attributes to it. The second half concerning Christian tradition literally supersedes the half on Jewish practice. Another interesting rhetorical element in the text is the words used to refer to Jewish people and the suspected connotations these words had for the audience. The comparison in the text relies on the idea that the blessings and freedoms celebrated and remembered during the Passover are the exact things Jewish people supposedly took from Jesus. An example of this is verse 96 of the Piri Pasha. The one who hung the earth in space is himself hanged. The one who fixed the heavens in place is himself impaled. The one who firmly fixed all things is himself firmly fixed to the tree. The Lord is insulted. God has been murdered. The king of Israel has been destroyed by the right hand of Israel. Note the rhetorical genius in this short passage. This word, Israel, is very interesting. There are two terms used in the Greek version to refer to Jewish people. Ho laos, or the people, and Israel, one who prevails with God in Hebrew. 
Koek and other scholars stress the significance of when either of these is used in the text. The first is used when contrasting the church to the Hebrews of the first Passover, and the second when discussing specifically the Jews present during the Passion, and Israel is then blamed for Jesus' death. This rhetorical device helps the author to paint the people as a model and the church as its fulfillment, while separating Israel from the rest as it never, quote-unquote, saw, let alone prevailed, with God. They were, as the homily states, his murderer. As discussed, we need to attempt to understand this message as the contemporary Christian audience did. In this spirit, two interesting things are brought up in Koek's work. Firstly, Thomas Grabel, classic scholar, importantly noted that the Jewish community of the second century of the Common Era in Asia Minor was a vibrant, numerous, and influential one. It is suggested that Jewish people were part of the persecution of Christians in the area, which Melito famously contested. This social-political context is important. It is very likely that Melito's comments on Jewish people are not just theologically motivated. Secondly, Stephen Wilson, historian, suggests the possibility that in using the past tense and specific examples of Jewish behaviors, Melito was referencing only Jews present during the Passion. He noted that it is unsure whether the Christian audience also associated the term Israel with contemporary Jews, as none of them would have known if and how they celebrated Passover since this would have happened behind closed doors. If anything, Kohik's book illustrates how little we can say with certainty about this document. While including quite extreme anti-Jewish rhetoric, the character of this rhetoric becomes less binary when considering the socio-political context, its audience, and references. Despite these nuances, it has been wielded throughout history, as so often happens, as unequivocally anti-Jewish, which, in a way, impacted its character, the way we view its language, and how it is considered in our cultural memory causing Eric Warner to describe Melito as the first poet of deicide. Whether a document's importance is determined by its actual content or the interpretation of said content, only history can tell.